started with the show, you guys. Um, today I want to discuss a recent news special that highlighted two very interesting aspects concerning the intersection of faith and culture. And how I found out about this was I was on Instagram and I think someone sent it to me. I cannot remember, but it was, I guess it was the news anchor posted it on her IG and there were a lot of riveting conversations surrounding what these pastors had to say. And just to set the foundation of what we're going to talk about, I am highlighting the ethnic expression here when I use the term black church, right? I am referring to a very specific societal structure, but please be clear. You guys know me according to scripture, the construct known as a black church or a white church simply does not exist, right? We have Galatians 3.28 that tells us that if we're in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so we can have a historical conversation uh, as to why in the American evangelical context, why there was this separation, right, between Negro Americans and white Americans in a church context. And in fact, I plan to do a show, a future show about that. However, broadly speaking, for the purposes of this show, um, when we get down to what the scriptures have always taught, God's church is not divided, right? We are unified by the blood of Christ. And it is unbiblical, if you did not know, for us to segment the bride of Christ into these ethnic distinctions. I know for the purposes of conversation and in the culture, we say it a lot, um, but I did want to at least set that foundational premise and make that clear. Now, with that said, I still need to deal with reality, right? And the reality is, is that in the visible church, what we see as we know it, meaning the church that we can see that people readily identify um, with without fact checking it, right? Just a construct, there is certainly an organism referred to as the black church. And I'll put it in air quotes. That's just a reality. They've segmented themselves off. They have a culture. They have a worldview. Um, it is a thing, not, not speaking biblically, but just culturally, that is a thing. And that organism by and large, like I said, it does, it comes with its own theology. And I would go as far as to say that it actually comes with its own Jesus, and its own God, and it's nothing like the Jesus of the scriptures, right? It is the black liberation Jesus, which is significantly different than the Jesus that is revealed to us in the scriptures. Um, they're, in their construct of this social construct known as the black church, it exists for purposes outside of biblical parameters. How do we know this? We know this because a biblical church, we're one trick pony, right? Like we just, we preach the doctrine of the one true God and the doctrines of Christ. The, the one true church, which is built up of all different ethnicities, it is built on the foundation of the apostles and Jesus is the chief cornerstone. So in that type of church, you're not gonna hear about your oppression, right, in a biblical church. Like, you're not going to hear about, you know, how the white man is evil and how, you know, we just need to rise up and revolt. You won't hear any sort of that type of pulpit pimpery or, or skin trading type sermons in a biblical church. So the pastor in a biblical church, he is not going to do something such as invite the adulterous district attorney, and then shower her with gifts and praise of a job well done. That's not going to happen in a biblical church. So as you can see, I'm trying to lay out some clear distinctions so that you can be able to tell the difference that when I'm speaking of this black church social construct, I am talking about something very specific, but it is not the same as when I just refer to the church universal. So now that, you know, I've gotten that out the way, 
I want to go ahead and share this first clip with you guys and see what you guys think. I want to know what you guys think about it. I am going to stop and start throughout because there's a lot to engage here, um, to engage with here, and the clip is not even that long. So let's go ahead and take a listen. It's Good Friday, three prominent faith leaders here in Jacksonville, Bishop Rudolph McKissick Jr., Bishop John Guns, and Pastor R.L. Gundy sit down for a candid conversation about the state of the black church and bridging generational divides. For me, the African-American church has always been the bedrock of everything within the community. Historically, black churches have played pivotal roles outside the realm of religion. In the historic sanctuary of Bethel Baptist Institutional Church, a meeting of the minds. It is the place where certain needs were met that systems did not allow. The name institutional, a signal across the country during a time of segregation. Churches bearing that name were safe havens where black people could go for job training when regular schools were not an option. The black Okay, so I want to go ahead and stop there because there are two points. I know very early on, it's only 54 seconds in, but I, I wanted to address two points that were spoken here um, by these gentlemen. Um, the, the first one was that the black church has always been the bedrock of everything that happened in the community. And then it is the place where certain needs were met, uh, where systems did not allow. And so to be fair, I would agree. I would agree with the sentiment behind those first two statements. Such a statement or an assessment, there is some accuracy to it. If we're going to talk about the ethnic expression of the church during a time when it was unlawful for Christians of different ethnicities to gather and meet, then yes, he is absolutely Correct. I want to deal charitably and honestly with the statements that are being made there. And there's no disagreement from me there. Because literally here in America, there was a circumstance, right? Namely, chattel slavery that prevented the biblical expression of what the church is supposed to be and what it's supposed to be as an existential reality. Slavery, the institution of chattel slavery, in America caused a huge chasm between believers because you had wicked individuals, just like you have in all societies, actually have this still happening today where they perverted the gospel and they perverted the teachings of scripture and used it as a form of subjugation and control. That actually happened. They purposely ignored parts of scripture that talked about unity in Christ, regardless of ethnic distinction. And so we cannot forget about the many uh, Negro Americans who were believers who learned how to read and write in the context of their local Negro church. The Lord, through his providence and sovereignty, managed to draw Negro Americans to himself who were even in the confines of slavery and they started their own churches. And I do not uh, I do not believe that they purposely segregated themselves. They were not allowed to worship with white Americans. However, under those circumstances, they were like, well, we got to gather. We have to gather. And in that church, there were some, um, I would say, uh, uh, not necessarily spiritual things that would occur, such as learning how to read and write using the Bible. Um, so the, and also I'll add the church served as double duty as the schoolhouse. That was true in both white and black context. The church and the community on Sunday was the church and then Monday through Friday, it was the schoolhouse. And so we do need to discuss um, and do this in an honest way, but we do need to also discuss the unbiblical way that believers who are supposed to be one in Christ were segregated from one another on the basis of ethnicity. That is actually true. That happened in this nation. And there were many Christians 
who spoke out about that and pointed out how wrong that was. Um, if it wasn't for believers, we would have not have had the abolitionist movement where people through their Christian conviction was like, this child of slavery system is wrong. And I'm not going to stop shouting out about it until the Negro American gets free. This is not, this is an unjust system and it is wrong. Um, and it is wrong and it was sinful because scripture admonishes us that the uh, uh, about the opposite of what is supposed to happen. Man stealing was wrong. And so we don't have to get into a whole historical discussion about that. But the scriptures do talk about in Ephesians 2.11, I don't know how anyone who's born from above could read Ephesians 2 verses 11 through 22 and think that they love God, but that it was also okay to segregate and be uh, humanly hostile to a people who were of a different ethnicity. I don't see how you could read that in scripture, but when I'm talking to, like I, I have a friend that I talk to about these things all the time, and I try to explain to him that this is why you have false expressions of Christianity, and then you have true expressions. And you could clearly see in during the time of slavery where there was this, this, this false Christianity, this guise, this veneer where a lot of wicked things were done, but that's not the expression of what a genuine believer would believe or do. Um, and then to the second point, I would also argue that during the civil rights movement, this was a time when the church absolutely was the gathering place for meetings and a lot of, I would say, political activism was spearheaded by what, what I would call now so-called religious leaders. Um, I don't necessarily want to get into a discussion now about MOK. Like, we can save that for another show. However, we can look back and we can see how the church and the Negro preacher was used to push agendas that when, when we examine this stuff biblically, the church really had no business being involved in such efforts. That's my opinion. We could have a biblical discussion about it, but we're not going to have time to do that right now. So overall, the circumstance that was present during the time that all of these social ills were happening, the need for having this social construct known as the black church. I get it. No one to deny that. Don't want to even act like we can't even acknowledge that. But I think the problem arose, this is my opinion, when the, uh, the Negro American by and large began to define their entire identity and existence around their present life struggles and their ethnicity. Like that can no longer be justified and nor do I think at any time was that ever uh, a, a righteous or, or, or biblical thing to do. It is sinful for any American to harden their heart toward another image bearer just because of ethnicity. And I understand that there was a time, right, where America didn't necessarily have a choice but to separate churches because it was, it was an unjust law, but it was a, a lawfully, that was the lay of the land. I don't want to condemn what once was, but the overarching question is, are things still that way today? And if not, why are we still operating like it is? That is the question that I want to present to you guys in the live chat. And perhaps we could chop it up in the comment section and talk about it. I'm going to go on and play the next clip, but let me know what you think about what I said. I see Workman app said the church adopted and transformed into a cultural center. I agree. I think it took a circumstance where it was like, okay, we love Jesus and we black and we can't go worship with them. So this goes beyond the scope of us gathering and worshiping together. Now it is morphing into something else. Um, someone else said, I'm black and my husband is white and we worship together and teach our children to worship the Lord in truth and spirit. Amen. That's how it is supposed to be. Absolutely, that's how it's supposed to be. So let's go ahead and continue with this clip. The black church, I believe, is here to provide 
a place where the soul of America can be saved. And as faith leaders work to welcome... Flag on the plate! <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I know it's soon. I know it's soon. But I had to call the flag on that play. This pastor, he just said, he said, the black church, I believe, is here to provide a place where the soul of America can be saved. That was the statement. Flag on the play. This is my response. And the reason why I'm calling flag on the play is because, first of all, I struggle. I struggle when I hear pastors speak in these kinds of categories. I Maybe it's me, and I'm open to be corrected and wrong, but I have an expectation for pastors to speak with much more clarity than the average lay person, right? I expect them to be a little bit more exact. Um, and I don't expect them to sound like the culture. Because if you're a pastor, a shepherd, or an elder, um, you know, and you're already set apart because you're a Christian, but because you're an overseer or a shepherd, I, I just have this expectation for you to be able to think in proper categories. Now, I could be being, now, I, I could be petty. I could be, right? And I probably am. Um, and this is a side note, just an observation that I was making. But what's, what's up with these American black pastors wearing the kente cloth? Like, I'm, I'm trying, like, sir, you're from here. I'm, why are you wearing that? Like, am I, am I just being picky? Y'all, am I being extra? Am I? And if I am, I apologize. Um, but I just, I don't know. I'm just like, are you from Ghana? No, you're not. Like, I don't think he doesn't speak or resemble someone of Ghanaian heritage. So I'm just trying to understand what's up. What's up with all the kente cloth, right? Like, I don't know. Anyway, let me get back on track, y'all. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, this this pastor, he starts talking about the black church again being this place where the soul of America can be saved. And I'm like, okay, I, I have to push back on that because I'm like, first, I want to ask, like, what does he mean by save? Right, when he's using that language, in what sense does he mean the word save? And he doesn't really clarify it, or maybe they chopped this up and didn't allow him um, to expound on that. But I'm asking, like, since when can America be saved, right? Like I know the Bible speaks in categories of individuals placing their faith and trust in Christ alone for the remission of their sin, but a nation, we don't have any evidence of this corporate or national salvation. We know from the scriptures that God elects people unto salvation. This is not some kind of corporate ushering in uh, into eternal life. I, and I, I understand the premise of this new special is to talk about the social ethnic expression of the black church. However, biblically pastors, pastors who aren't looking at the body of Christ through melanin tinted glasses, if they really wanted to garner the ear of the culture and like say something really prolific and, and God honoring, in my opinion, this would have been the perfect time for him to correct the flawed understanding that, well, first of all, there really is no such thing as the black church, right? Like that's how, that's the direction that I would have taken the conversation. But I'm arguing that this is part of the reason why, in my opinion, why the construct known as the black church, why I believe it is dying. And quite frankly, on some level, it should die. And, and I know that you're just like, what do you mean the black church should die? I'm talking about as a construct. Why? Because Jesus put to death such a distinction when he died on the cross and he said it is finished, right? To tell us that, like we're really this weekend are celebrating the resurrection of our savior who died on the cross and dividing what the dividing line or wall of hostility was abolished. Right. If, if we're going to read Ephesians 2 verses 11 through 22, matter of fact, let's go ahead really, really quickly so that we uh, you all understand what I'm talking about. Um, Ephesians 2 11 says, therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles. Right. That would be me. 
that would be you. If you weren't an ethnic Jew, that's who he was talking to, the Apostle Paul here. He goes, Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commands, mints expressed in ordinances that he might create himself in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place by God, for God, by the spirit. Yes. When we read that, I don't see how we have room to have these conversations about, you know, the black church is the place where the soul of America can be saved. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't have a book, chapter, and verse for that. And since he didn't clarify what he meant by that, um, I don't know. I don't know exactly what he means. However, I know y'all might think that I'm being super picky here. But perhaps the reason why these types of conversations keep picking up momentum and we aren't able to engage in truth is because no one wants to just stand up and say, perhaps it's time for the black church as we know it, that construct to die. Yes, there was a time when out of necessity, there were social conditions that kept us separate for a time, but we are here now. Like, let's be biblical instead of cultural. Let us, let us walk into the freedom that we just read about, the good news that we just read about in Ephesians 2.11, like this dividing wall of hostility, like Christ bore that in his body. There, there's, there's no more separation there along these ethnic lines. We're all one in Christ now, if you're in Christ. Now hear me clearly, I am not saying that you can't go to a church that's full of only black people. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that you can't go to a church that's full of just only white people. I never said any of the thing along those lines. Churches, they tend to reflect the demographic of their communities where they're located, right? So I'm not saying that either of those ethnic expressions are wrong. But what I am saying is that we shouldn't be describing the church based on the ethnicity of those who attend. Like if it's a biblical church, right? Rooted in the scriptures with biblical leadership, then it's just the church, right? The church is to be identified by who it represents. And that's Jesus, the Messiah. We're simply the church, like that's it. Like we, we're being built up, like I just read, into a spiritual house. We're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Like, what else do we need? We're being built together into this dwelling place for God by his spirit, not on the basis of the ethnicity of the people inside, but based on who we are in Christ Jesus. So yes. Flag on the play. Do a flag on that play because pastors should avoid using this type of language because it's not biblical. I get it. 
right? He got on his kente cloth outfit. So he's got us, he's trying to stay on cold. Like he's all in feeling all his African connection. I understand all of that, right? Um, but pastors should be using biblical language and not perpetuating messages that they are hearing out in the culture. So anyway, let's continue. Welcome members old and new. Research shows an exodus of millennials and Gen Z. They just want to hear the truth. One, they want the church to be inclusive, diverse, and address the issues of race, sexual orientation. Bishop Guns and McKissick, do you guys address race and sexual orientation in your church? I think you have to. Okay. I, I, <laughs> Pastor Gundy just said it so powerfully. You, you have to realize that you have everything in your church. On the top. Flag on the plate. All right. Sorry. I need some yellow flags. Somebody want to give me some yellow flags from Amazon and send them. Y'all shout out and email me and let me know. Um, you guys, this, this next statement that he made, I, I want to engage with it. Um, I, I want to engage with it because one of the pastors, he starts off and he says, they just want to hear the truth. And I was like, Ooh, like I was perking up and I was getting excited. But then he goes, they want the church, they want the church to be inclusive, diverse, and address the issues of race and sexual orientation. I was like, okay, well, I, I agree. Believe it or not, true biblical churches actually do address these things. The issue is that they just may not address them in the way that the culture believes they should be addressed. And in fact, let me help any of you guys who might be confused. I'm going to help you understand exactly how a biblical church, regardless of ethnic expression, is supposed to address these topics, right? So like, let me see, like Galatians 3.23. Galatians 3.23 emphatically affirms that we are one in Christ Jesus. Like, I don't know how much more inclusive you can be like, let's go up. Let's go ahead and read it. Can y'all see that right there? But now faith has come. We are no longer under a guardian for in Christ Jesus. You are all sons of God through faith. Look at all that inclusivity for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You guys, Jesus was all about inclusivity. We just need to remember that the inclusivity is on his terms, not ours, right? In the, house, in the household of faith, our status as believers makes us all equal in terms of our value, our essence, and our worth. Both the men and the women together, we can now enjoy all the privileges and obligations and inheritance rights as God's children. That sounds pretty inclusive to me, right? The whole gospel message is a message of inclusivity in the sense that prior to the advent of Jesus as Messiah, when all we had was the Mosaic law, there was definitely, there was definitely all of these distinctions, right? If you weren't a Jew, you were cut off. There was no hope for you. But look what God has done for us in Christ. The distinction between Jew and Gentile, it is broken down. Us Gentiles, like we don't have to become a Jew to be reconciled to God. There is, there is no slave nor free, male nor female. These correspond to the truth that old divisions, wrong attitudes of superiority or inferiority, those things are done away with when it comes to being one in Christ. So it doesn't mean that there's no distinction in terms of God's created order and what our roles are. But this, you guys, this is good news because Everyone who is looking for diversity, the gospel already provides that. Like this verse is literally teaching us that we are to have unity within diversity 
And we don't have to have sameness to achieve the biblical expression of equality. But here's the kicker though. When this pastor mentions inclusive and diverse, let me ask y'all this. Do y'all think that he is talking about what I'm talking about? Or is he picking up on some other ideology from the culture? I, I'm curious to know, what do you guys think? Do you think he is referring to the inclusivity and diversity that the gospel offers? Or is he trying to explain something else? I want you guys type biblical in the chat if you believe what he is talking about is biblical or type unbiblical in the chat if you think he is talking about what the culture is talking about. Because when I'm listening to him and he's using these buzzwords phrases, I'm struggling to see if he and I are speaking the same gospel-centric message that preaches all about diversity, all about inclusion. But I'm curious to know what he's talking about. This is what I, this is what I'm going to say. I am so glad that this pastor mentioned race. Yes. I'm glad he mentioned it because I'm like, okay, let's talk about race. He mentioned race in terms of the, these are things that they, they want us to talk about. But here's the kicker. And what I'm asking is, are we going to have a biblical conversation about race or are we going to have a secular humanistic conversation about race? Because more importantly, I like using the word ethnicity. I don't like using race. I know what people mean when they say it. I like using the word ethnicity because there's only one race and that's the human race. However, ethnicity is a more biblically, biblically accurate way to have this discussion. And if we are talking to pastors, I am trying to understand why aren't they using biblical language, right? Now they don't hear, um, but if they happen to see this video, I hope that they would consider renewing their minds, right? Conforming to more of a biblical worldview so that when they have to communicate these things of, of, of theological importance to the culture, that they would use biblical language and present more of a biblical worldview. But in listening to what they are saying, I don't believe that they are saying what I am about to talk about, right? Because the fundamental problem that I see in these discussions is the people who should be the authority on racism, they don't talk like pastors, right? Like they sound, they sound more like social justice warriors. They don't tell their people that are in charge, that they're in charge or, or shepherding in their care. They don't tell their people the biblical truth uh, about partiality and the sin of partiality. But do you know what? The reason why they can't talk about partiality in biblical terms is because they spew wicked and evil rhetoric toward the white people and they do it freely without ever being checked or held accountable. So... If, if you're in the typical black church and you listen to some of the things that they say from the pulpit, you're like, how are you a Christian speaking this way? We see the clips on YouTube all the time, the way they disparage and talk about, they would call it white supremacy or racism, but they're not speaking in biblical language, right? Like I call it all of their Jerome Crow rhetoric. We hear it coming from these pulpits, and in some of these 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 churches, um, th these th some of these pastors, I would say, I think they need to realize that we all have um, all of that kind of it's going on in all of these churches. And when you hear them talk about it, sometimes it makes you wonder if they've ever picked up a Bible. Why are they speaking in these kinds of categories? This is not how Christians are supposed to think about other image bearers in the world. Um, but they speak this way very, very freely, and they're really comfortable talking about it. Um, but I threw, a I threw a flag on this play because um, when we talk about who makes up the church, right, the church is not this body of just random people, 
right? I'm asking, is the church the body of Christ made up of those who are born again? Like, aren't we supposed to be the ones that are made alive in Christ? Aren't we supposed to be the ones that are like the such were some of you? So if that is us, when he talks about, you know, they want us, let me find the quote. He says, they want us to be inclusive, diverse, and address the issues of race and sexual orientation. And then he goes on to say that, you know, we, we're going to have a little bit of some of all of that in our church. And I'm, I'm confused when I hear that because I'm like, the body of Christ, we're supposed to be the such were some of you. Right, like we're supposed to be the ones that were washed and were cleansed. And so if if this is who the church is supposed to be, why do you have all of that other stuff going on in your church? That That is a legitimate question. I, I would argue that the reason why a lot of these pastors feel that they have to tailor their message because they got all this other stuff going on in their church, the reason why these churches have all this debauchery and licentiousness going on is because their churches, they want to cast a wide net. They want a broad road, big tent type of organization. They don't want the biblical narrow road where few find it. And so you're not, you're, they, they, they want um, the vast majority of people to be, they want to create an attractive model so that everyone can come so they can amass a larger church, a larger congregation, a larger following, as opposed to understanding that the road to eternal life, it is a narrow road, few are going to find it. You're not the person you once were, right? And once you become added once you're born again and added to the church, you are a you're you're other, you're different. So so many organizations that claim to be churches, they want to be all things to all people. And I've even heard people argue and say, "Well, you know, you know, the church is a hospital." And I'm like, "No, it's not. No, it's not. We don't even the Bible never speaks of the church in such a category." The world is a hospital, right? The world is where everybody is sick and burdened down because of their sin. But the people of God, we are those who've been redeemed, right? We've been freed from the curse of the law and the sin of bondage. Like we believe that Christ bore our sin in his body on a tree. So this is you guys, well, we're all celebrating this weekend. So if this is who we are, if the church represents the people of God, the household of faith, we're exiles passing through here. We're supposed to be the ones who abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against the soul. But believers are the ones, as we live out the rest of our time here on earth, we're no longer living for these human passions. Y'all, we live for the will of God. That's the difference. So these pastors... They don't speak to me as individuals who know this because they're trying to build and grow and attract people to their organizations by other means instead of using the biblical model, which is preach Christ and that's it. Like, like the moment you start strategizing for a new gimmick or a new social program or a new attraction model as your method of doing ministry, you will always be banging your head up against the wall, asking yourself, you know, well, why isn't this working? You know, why don't the young people, why don't they want to come? Listen, they don't want to come because they see what you're doing as fraudulent. They don't believe anything you're saying. And why should they? Are you leading with the truth about their falling condition and what the remedy is for their sin problem? Because if you aren't leading with that, you need to just be quiet and go find something else to do. And that's just the God honest truth. But let us continue. The topic of homosexuality. 62% the majority say homosexuality should be accepted. And I say to the LBGTQIA plus community, you know, my message is my message. I'm not going to bash you. I'm not going to do anything. And I'm going to love you. The question is, can I have a theological difference with you and still love you and will you allow me to be your pastor? Flag on the plate. 
sir. Sir, you were so close. You were so close yet so far. Did y'all catch that? Oh, my word. Listen, y'all. He, so he was so close. Let me show y'all this. Y'all see this graphic right here? According to this graphic, okay, let's just, let's just examine this with a critical biblical worldview. Seven out of 10 black Christians say that opposing sexism is essential to their faith. And I'm like, first of all, okay, hold on, y'all can't see me. Let me make it a little small. It's too big. I'll just put it down here. I'm short. Um, first, we need to first talk and define what, what the heck do they mean by sexism? Now, I've got some ideas because nowhere in the Bible is such a construct advocated for or celebrated. So my Bible tells me that God has a created order. He's established these roles and functions for various members of his created order. But having clearly defined roles is hardly what I would call sexism. And also this sentiment implies that seven out of 10 black Christians believe that within the church, we need to do away with gender roles and that women can be pastors and can operate and function in the office that is reserved for men only as it expressed, as it is, is as it is expressed in scripture. If that's what they mean, then we most definitely we have a problem. Look at the statistics right here. It's saying from this Pew Research that the exodus from these black churches is because seven out of 10 say opposing sexism is essential to their faith. And 85% say that women should be able to serve as a senior religious leader of a congregation. I am arguing that this is what happens when you allow the world to define who you are, why you exist, and how you are to function. This is the result of that. This is, we don't get, to, I don't know where we got this idea from. We don't get to redefine what we think the church should be or how it should operate. The church does not conform to the culture. Like we don't get with the times. Okay, we're one trick ponies as I always say, we have a faith that has been handed down to us by the apostles and the prophets. Jesus has already laid out and defined who his bride is, what she must be, and who gets to shepherd and lead over her. So I'm sorry. Seven out of 10 of these black Christians who believe that opposing sexism is essential to their faith, I would argue that the faith that they have is an idol. It is something that they've created in their own mind. It is not real. It is not legitimate. It's counterfeit. What else do you call it? I, I, I can't legitimize it because you don't get to just decide and come bringing your cultural baggage and say, well, the black church needs to get with it because we're just, we're not going to tolerate sexism. Well, we need to define what you mean by sexism. I need, I have more questions. I can assume what they mean when they say that, but I'd rather just ask more probing questions. How are you defining sexism? What does that mean? Because if I say the office of pastor, elder, bishop, overseer is reserved for men, that is not a sexist statement. That is a biblical statement. It's not sexism. It is not saying that women are not valuable. It is not saying that women don't contribute in valuable ways to the work of ministry. That is not what it's saying. But it's interesting how words and language is used in order to manipulate and hijack concepts. So when they say sexism, I need more information to understand what they mean. Now I can pick up from the context clues what they mean based on that second statistics, 85% are saying that women should be the senior religious leader. I'm, I'm asking on what basis? On what biblical basis are you making such an argument? Um, because I, I can make a biblical case for why that is not true. And I can also make a biblical case for if you're going to decide that the church is going to function in a way that the Bible doesn't describe, you right, that is your church, but it is not the church of a living God. It is not a biblical one. 
And it is one that any solid believer who believes the scriptures would have to reject. Okay. So when it talks about that next statistic, um, that, that 85%, you guys, that is incredibly high, but it also represents those that I would say who are on that broad road. If I were a pastor and I saw this Pew Research statistic, it would tell me like, I got a lot of work to do. I have a lot of work to do in the sense that we need to run out and go and find some women to ordain. If I'm a pastor and I'm seeing this and I'm not desiring to be biblical, I'm like, we got to go. We got to go get us some women, right? Because we don't get some women over here. We're not going to attract these people. Rather, I would say it demonstrates to me that we've not done a good job of following the Bible and teaching people from a biblical perspective what we believe and why we believe it, right? Like, so if I'm a pastor and I want to be on the broad road and I'm, I'm either in it for the money or the power or the fame or the notoriety or just, just the pure, I just like church culture, I would go out and run out and start ordaining some women. We actually saw that happen. I saw that happen in several churches in my community because they wanted to get with the times because they got the memo that, you know, the Gen Z's and the millennials, they really want to see, you know, gender equity. So it's like, well, I got to make a woman, my assistant female pastor then. It wasn't because they saw it in the scriptures. It was because they were doing it for other reasons. But if I'm a biblical pastor, I'm like, I believe that we're not doing a good enough job of teaching people from the scriptures what we believe and why we believe it. And so in my opinion, this is more of an indictment on these pastors who have spent so many years compromising, not holding fast to the trustworthy word as taught, that they are now, they're being backed into a corner and told that, it, that they need to change. And if they want to attract more people to their church, they've got to get with the program. Th this entire debate is so weird to me because Christ is actually purifying his church, right? Like we can see throughout history, various things that God and his providence allowed to happen in order to purify his church. And yet you have some people that are looking to bring in goats on purpose. I know that was a very harsh statement, but they are literally, they don't want to be fishers of men where they go out, give the gospel and make disciples. They want to, they want to bring in the goats, right? This is, this is what happens when you are listening to church growth strategists, instead of just opening up your Bible and just doing what you were called to do so that you can be found faithful. I have a Bible study group that I put together with some of the ladies who follow this channel. And we went through the book of First Peter. And you guys, it was an amazing journey. But today, we talked about shepherds, right? And we talked about how faithful shepherds, how they're going to be the ones who receive the unfading crown of glory for their faithfulness and, and being examples to the flock and how they exercise oversight over God's sheep. You're not going to get the unfading crown of glory when you structure your church using an attractional model or a gimmick, right? Like Jesus left you the blueprint. Why is the Bible not good enough for y'all? Peter talks about those false shepherds who are doing what they do for shameful gain. I am saying that this is true of these pastors, probably right. I don't, I'm not saying that this is true of these pastors right here. That's not what I'm saying. I don't, I don't know these people, right? However, when you try to compromise with goats, you are no longer shepherding sheep. When, the, when that pastor, not the one on the left, the other one with, with the kente on, when he said, you know, my message is my message, but then in the next breath, he left the door open for compromise when he said, you know, well, is it, is it possible for us to have a theological difference? You know, I still love you, but will you allow me to still be your pastor? And I'm like, 
Biblically, no, 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 sir. Why, why would you, why would you lay aside your worldview just so that you can add more members to the roster? So, and say that you're their pastor. I, I, I don't understand for me, you're not loving the LGBTQIA community by saying, you know, my message is my message, but you know, can we just agree to disagree? No. Since when do we agree to disagree on sin, sir? Like you should know this. The, you guys, this is part of the male cowardice that I've been talking about in previous episodes. Can y'all, can y'all just give me some men who aren't afraid, right? Like why? Why can't you just declare the truth in love? D do you not know that the world is hostile to our message? Do, do you not know that they hate the light? Yes. In their hatred and aversion to the light, you're supposed to be the light anyway. You're supposed to be the light anyway so that their deeds can be um, exposed. But what purpose? What purpose do you serve as a pastor or a shepherd or an ambassador? You're supposed to be a follower of Christ. If you want people to come and be a part of your faith community, yet you are like, well, you know, you, you can remain in your sin. Just let me be your pastor. Like what, what kind of gospel is that? Right? Like surely you aren't preaching the gospel. That's the power of God unto salvation. You can't possibly be preaching the truth about our sinful condition. You're not called to be a friend of the world. You're called to present Christ and to come with the gospel of Christ that commands people to repent and believe, right? Like there's no belief apart from repentance. And so, you know, I don't know where these people went to school, but these seminarians confuse me. This is, this is very confusing to me. And, and I don't like it because it leaves rooms for be like, you know, I, I'm going to preach my message, but can we on the side maybe have a theological discussion? And, you know, we may not agree, but can I still be your pastor? Like, what? No. I thought you loved these people's souls. How are you shepherding over them? And you don't even want to tell them the truth and then just relegate it to some theological conversation. We're talking about their eternal soul. We're talking about the sin that separates us from a righteous and holy God. No, we can't just agree to disagree. We, we need to have the discussion and you should be preaching it from your pulpit, but that's hard. That's hard to do when you taking money from political parties that don't like that message. So you gotta, you gotta be quiet. So we get it, but let's continue. Arch has participated in disenfranchisement. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. We have been a part of yes. oppressing yes. our own people. Yes. Which is why we aren't trusted. The church's relevance is in question. Bishop Guns believes a reminder of its value is on the way. You know, we're about to have an election that's going to be traumatic for this country. It's going to be the stability of institutions like the black church that's going to navigate people whose voices are being muted by inequitable policies and practices. It's going to be this, this here, that gets us through it. Okay, so I was going to throw a flag. I was going to throw a flag, but I didn't. I thought about it. I thought about it, but I changed my mind. Okay, so I'm going to tell you why I changed my mind. He is absolutely right in the sense that, yes, I agree. The black church sold out a long time ago. Yes, but when, when I say sold out, I'm not talking about being like sold out for the truth, righteousness, or being sold out for Jesus. No, they, let's just be honest, a lot of them sold out to the Democratic Party. Like I have friends on the inside who have literally told me this. He was like, why do you think they all come with the same on-code message? He was like, you don't think that their emails circulated with all of these pastors and it sends them the attachment of what to say to their people? Right. And it, all of them around the same weekend, they all have the same types of events. It is a very consorted effort. Yes. These people sold out a long time ago. OK, they took money. Power and influence in exchange for access to their sheep. Right. They, they pushed child assassination in the womb. Yes. I'm talking to you, Jamal Bryan and Raphael Warnock and William Murphy. I see 
We see the unbiblical bootlegging you're doing down here in Atlanta. I would call you guys a brood of vipers because that's exactly what you were doing when you lie and push harmful messaging to the women of your congregation. Not only that, you guys, this is beyond child assassination in the womb. A lot, of, there's this consorted effort where these pastors, they push harmful inoculations on their people by brainwashing them and making them think that these biologics are safe and effective, yet their people are dropping like flies, being exposed and diagnosed with cancer and autoimmune diseases out of nowhere. We don't have to have a conversation about that, but maybe one day I will, because I am still feeling some sort of kind of way about that. But they will lie and push racist propaganda by calling everything racist, making their sheep believe that they are helpless victims chained by the ankle of some nameless, faceless white oppressor. Yes, they do all of these things in the name of God, preaching pain and oppression instead of, instead of telling their people of who they are in Christ. Y'all don't think it's strange that so many of these churches are always on code pushing the same message? Do you not think it's just a, listen, type strange in the chat if it seems just a little bit strange to you. But if you're like, no, this is normal. If type normal, if you think that it is perfectly normal for all of these churches to coincidentally push the same types of message. But I am telling you not what I heard. I'm telling you what I know. A lot of these pastors are compromised and they are accepting things, money, gifts, notoriety, power, and influence in exchange. It's just, just tell your people this message right here. You know, we, this is what we need you to say. And they be like, yes, master, I sure will. I sure do love that Democrat money. Absolutely. You don't have to worry. I will, I will keep the people on task. Mm-hmm. Anyway, very strange, very strange. So when that one particular pastor, when he says, you know, we've, we've been guilty of disenfranchising our own people, which is why we are not trusted. I'm like, you know what? I agree. I agree, but I'm only agreeing if we are defining disenfranchisement the same way. Like if he's referring to how historically only men were allowed to preach and teach an authority over the church and only men are allowed to function in the role of pastor elder, then in that case, I would disagree. That is not disenfranchisement. That's just called being biblical, right? Like, so don't allow, once again, do not allow the world to redefine terms or to improperly apply them to matters of theological importance. Do not use Lucifer's language. Don't do it. The, the unbelieving world, the culture, they don't get the right to tell us who the church is and how we're supposed to be. We are submitted to the Lordship of Jesus. So if they have beef with our ecclesiastical structure, then they have beef with the Apostle Paul by way of the Holy Spirit. So essentially, their beef is with God. Their beef is not with us. It's with what is written. But then... This pastor makes this last statement where he says, you know, well, the narrator says that the church's relevance is in question. And then the last pastor, I think his name is Bishop Guns, he starts to expound upon that by making the assertion that, you know, we're about to have an election and, you know, it's, it's going to be traumatic for this country. And he's, you know, he said something about, you know, it's, it's going to be the stability of institutions like the black church that's going to navigate people, you know, who, whose voices, how did he say it? Whose voices have been muted by inequitable policies and practices. Um, and he believes that, you know, it's going to take them, us, them, their, their construct of the black church to get people through it. And I was like, you know, this is really loaded. This was a really loaded statement, and I, I really didn't know where to start. Um, but first of all, if, if, if you are a representative of the church, I don't doubt that this election, um, I, I don't doubt that this election is, is, is going to be traumatic, right? Like, it's going to be traumatic for the entire country, regardless of who wins. 
right? Because if Biden wins, it's going to be traumatic because we're all just going to just slide further and further into this economic travesty and, and our national stability. It's just going to be shot. That's just a fact, right? Because we don't even know if he's going to be alive and make it to November. And if he doesn't make it to November, then that means we stuck with heels up Harris. And I just, the thought of that is just, that is a travesty. Um, and we all, it's going to be traumatic. Okay. Now, um, it, we, we, we'll, we'll just also, if that happens, we're going to be a nation overrun and invaded by people who don't have our best interest at heart. Like it's already happening now. Right. We're already experiencing what it's like to live under the lack of law and order. So that's just going to be more normalized. And it's, it's going to be bad. Right. It ain't going to be pretty. God's people, we're going to be fine. But it is what it is. However, with that said, if Trump wins, it's going to be traumatic because people are in an, it. They have this intense hatred in their heart for that man. And they're just going to to just unleash all of the hatred even if things at the pump are phenomenal, like gas, it's just, we, we're spending $1.99 again, they, they still going to be mad, right? If the price of groceries goes down to less than the price of a mortgage, even if the borders are closed and law and order is restored, the hatred in the hearts of many is simply going to grow worse because people are sinful and wicked and they need to invent new ways to be evil. And so they're just going to, they probably going to tell up some stuff in the street because they're mad. Um, and we'll have to endure four more years of more division in this country. I'm just used to it at this point. So some, either way, regardless of who's wins, there's going to be some trauma, right? Some of it's going to be self-inflicted, right? And then some of it is just going to be inflicted as a result of circumstance. It, it just is what it is. But when this pastor speaks like this and he says, you know, that the people's voices are being muted by uh, equitable policies and practices. I just want to ask, I'm like, what voices? Like, who's muting people? Who's, which voices are we talking about? Like, what, what inequitable policies and practices are you speaking of? I need to know the specifics. Because they love speaking in this broad language. And when you press them, and you really press them, you're just like, where is that happening? Who's, is there someone doing that to you? Because it's, if they don't identify it, it's hard for us to engage with what they're talking about. But to me, this man sounds like he's trying to get us to run in the victim Olympics with him and Fonnie Willis and the rest of the Marxists. And I'm not here to run that race. I don't, I don't, I don't want to tee up with, you know, my running shoes and just wait. No, I don't want to run in that race. And so I just need to know, it would have been nice to know specifically what he was talking about when he was speaking that language. Um, but since he wasn't allowed to expound on that, um, we'll never know. But when, when I hear a pastor sounding like a Marxist, I get very worried. Um, very, very worried. <laughs>